Good morning, everyone. We're just letting our attendees all join from the waiting room. Um, if anyone was having a little dance there, now um, now's the time to concentrate. Please say hi and let us know who you are um, in the chat, um, uh, where you're calling from, where you're listening in from, um, perhaps which school you're from, if you're using Arbor, um, anything you'd like to share with us. Plenty of names I recognize there, so it's good to say hi to people again. Let's give everyone 30 more seconds to get their sound together as well. <clears throat> Welcome everybody. We've got the whole of England here in Arborfest today. It's very exciting. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, anyone joining now, we've got a competition uh, for Arbfest today as well. So you could do that while we're getting started if you haven't already done it, although I'm gonna try and win those brownies myself. So all you need to do is post a photo on either LinkedIn or Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag Arborfest um, and mention us. So our, our uh, handle is at ArborEdu um, and include a picture. So whether you're watching from, uh, from your school, from your trust office, from your uh, home office, kitchen, sofa. You might be walking in the park and listening to Arborfest talks. We'd love to see that. And if you haven't had those brownies yet, they are well worth it. 30 second tweet for a box of those brownies, I'd say that's a good return on investment. So go for it. Um, thanks everybody for introducing themselves as well. So, um, so I think we're gonna kick off two minutes past 10 and there's loads for us to cover in this session as well. Um, so my name's Philippa Diaz and I'm one of the directors here of Arbor Education. My role is chief revenue officer and that means that my team and I are responsible for introducing schools to Arbor and bringing them on the journey with us uh, when they first start. Uh, we work across uh, individual schools, academy trusts, local authorities and our partners, which are uh, we're really welcome to uh, pleased to welcome so many of them here today as well. Um, I've been with Arbor for now over seven and a half years, so I feel like a veteran uh, of our journey as well. Um, when I first started at Arbor, um, I was also the vice chair of a small academy trust. Um, so I had two fairly challenging roles. Um, and so I first came across Mary at that time. Um, I was looking for some advice and wisdom on how to manage um, but teams of teachers in lots of different ways. So as I said, my team here at Arbor, um, there are many ex-head teachers and ex-school leaders in my team as well. Um, and the title of her book that I found then, High Challenge, Low Threat, still available if you haven't read it, was extremely efficient, incredibly direct and incredibly effective as well. And I was reading through it again last night to remind myself of some of the advice in that book. So I'm really excited that we've got her with us here today um, so we can um, be reminded of some of that wisdom too. Um, Mary, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Philippa. I'm delighted to be with you all here this morning. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join to join my session. Um, so um, I've got plenty um, of uh, things to be sharing with you in relation to um, fewer things in greater depth, getting back on track. Um, but it doesn't mean I'm right. So um, I really welcome uh, disagreement um, because it's through respectful disagreement that we refine our ideas. Uh, we either are in a place where we justify what we believe to be uh, correct in any particular instance, but also uh, it can help us to change our minds when we have strong evidence uh, to uh, conflict with our current beliefs. So I always welcome that. So I'm hoping that there's going to be some robust uh, comments um, as they come through in the chat, which we'll be picking up at the end, uh, which isn't to say you're allowed to agree as well. It's just, I think it's really interesting when people disagree as a matter of principle. Um, so, um, what I'm addressing then this morning are fewer things in greater depth. And before I get going, I just want to say a few words about um, how I think we need to be looking after ourselves first uh, in the metaphorical sense, not the literal sense, which I know you're all having to do. Um, but we all remember the times when we were able to take flights on aeroplanes and um, when they were giving out the health and safety instructions, um, there was always a message that in the case of an emergency, 
um, if we were traveling with someone who was either vulnerable or a young child, we must put our own masks on first. So why is that? Well, it's because we can't look after other people unless we're safe and sound ourselves. And you don't need me to tell you um, how demanding, how exhilarating, exciting and exhausting it is in schools in general normal times. And it's been that to the power of 10 in the uh, times that you've been through and you're currently going through. Um, and so uh, while there's nothing we can do about what's happening in the wider world in relation to the pandemic, I think there are some things that we should be thinking about uh, that we do have control over. So I'm going to sound like grandma now, um, but I think it's really important that we eat proper food on a regular basis, that we get a bit of fresh air every day, and that we go to bed in reasonable time. And unless our nights are interrupted by little people uh, or for any other reason, I think we've got an obligation to make sure that we are rested. Um, huge amounts of evidence that uh, we can't perform properly unless we take into account some of those things. Now, I draw a lot on the work of Greg McCann and essentialism, and he talks about rest being a responsibility. Rest is a responsibility. It's not a luxury. Um, and what flows from that is that um, I'm getting quite a few people uh, within schools at all levels saying, well, you know, we're just simply not as far ahead as we'd like to be on some of the things we'd planned in relation either to the curriculum or other aspects of school improvement. Well, that's just how it is. And, you know, not to beat ourselves up over that because we've only got so much bandwidth that we can deal with anything at any one time. And, you know, the work that you've been doing around lockdown arrangements and coming out of lockdown, and I know some people are having to self-isolate again in some classes, but um, that relates to safeguarding. And if there's one piece of work which is absolutely non-negotiable um, in our context, it is safeguarding. And so the rest will still be there. Uh, when we have the time. So I'm a great believer in pace, appropriate pace at the, at the right time. So whatever I share with you in, in this session, it's not for action this day, it's for when you're ready. Um, so there are three elements that um, I, I'm just going to be talking to the headlines of for this session. So the first is making the case for fewer things in greater depth. Um, the second is um, some of the best bets um, emerging from uh, the research, um, particularly in the field of cognitive science. And then the third is um, some of the things that we might legitimately cut back on um, in order to set clearer, um, clearer priorities on the things that make most difference to the learning of our children in our settings. Um, so um, underpinning this is, is the notion of di the disciplined pursuit of less. Um, and this is um, a, a, a real mantra of uh, Greg McCann's work that I've drawn on, uh, particularly in my latest work, Back on Track, uh, which came out in September. Um, and McCann um, very clearly lays out that if you have too many priorities, you're simply not going to do anything really well. And so it's about really committing to those things that we have the evidence and knowledge are going to make the greatest difference to the children in our settings. Uh, the second person that I, or thinker that I draw on is, is um, Pareto uh, and the 80-20 rule, the Pareto rule. So Pareto was a professor, uh, an Italian professor working in the University of Lausanne in the um, 1890s. And his research was focused on land um, ownership uh, within, in Italy. Um, and his work found that 80% of the land at that time was owned by 20% of the population. And he speculated that might apply to other um, countries and uh, in other fields as well. And it turns out this this um, this broad rule, 80-20 rule, does apply across lots of uh, contexts and lots of settings, both in the private uh, sector and in the public sphere. It's it's been taken up by a lot of leadership and management theorists. So. Um, Basically, what that's saying is that a relatively small amount of input has a disproportionate um, impact. And um, so it's not doesn't have to be literally 80-20, but it is about being very mindful that there are some things that we do that have a far greater impact than others. And um, so let's cut out some of the things that are not having the same impact. And then finally, this is slightly tongue in cheek, but Marie Kondo's work um, uh, where she talks about, um, you know, does this bring joy? Does this spark joy? You know, her decluttering. And I put that in slightly tongue in cheek. But I think she does have a, a point that in developed communities, we all have far too much stuff. 
And actually, we don't use that properly unless we absolutely bring it down to the things that um, really do spark joy. And I think that applies to some of the processes and some of the resources that we use in school. Um, so I've been talking about this for quite a while, but then I was talking to a colleague who does a lot of work in the States and she said, oh, apparently there's a there's a, a, a project in um, one of the education faculties, I think at Harvard or, or somewhere else anyway, a very high, um, highly regarded university, where they're calling it the condo project in terms of the curriculum. So what can be stripped back in order to focus on the things that have the greatest difference? Um, so what I'm arguing from this is that we've got to stop trying to do everything. <laughs> and I think this is an issue for us in the sector because, um, you know, we're well intentioned, we want the best for our children and our communities, but we simply can't do everything. And so when we decide that some things are more important than others, um, it means that there will be trade offs. And I think this is um, psychologically quite important to recognize that there will be some resistance to this because we might want to do some things. But actually, we've made a decision we're going to do others because we know they're going to have greater impact. And so to be prepared for some of the pushback um, on that. Um, so I think this work can be underpinned by careful curiosity and asking questions. It's not um, it's not a three line whip on anything. It's just like um, a, a proper discourse about, well, is what we're doing uh, really worthwhile or are we just doing it because we've always uh, done this? And underpinning that, I think it's helpful to keep in mind, well, what is it that adds the greatest value? So there's overwhelming evidence from all sorts of quarters, not just my own work, that it's the quality of the curriculum that makes the greatest difference for the greatest number of children. And um, so that really ought to be our priority. Now, um, I, I get slightly annoyed at some of the conversations around the curriculum um, that, that are hinting that the curriculum and the focus on the curriculum is a new thing, as though schools have not been doing anything on the curriculum like forever, which is completely ridiculous, obviously. Um, but there's no doubt that the, the quality of the curriculum and, and conversations around that have gone up the agenda. And so that is why we've got the quality of education judgment in the latest framework um, from Ofsted, which came in in 2019, September. Um, now, we do this because it's important work, uh, not because we're looking to satisfy um, Ofsted uh, teams. Um, so it's that way round. Um, but I think it's useful to just um, do some brief headlines for you know what my work and Ofsted's research has found in relation to the curriculum that fed into uh, the quality of education judgment and why it became a higher priority. Um, and so just the headlines, um, three broad headlines, is that what was found is that in some schools, priorities became distorted. Um, so um, actually, for good reasons, this is never a blame game, but um, what happened in some primaries was that in order for children to do well in their SATs, um, they were given a diet of SATs practice in year six, sometimes drifting into year five in the mistaken belief that that was going to get better results. Um, but if you look at the if you look at the scores for the children who didn't do so well, um, in the reading papers for 2019, which is the last year for which we've got any um, data, though they tended not to do so well because of a lack of vocabulary. OK, so how do we develop children's vocabulary? Well, it's through a broad and balanced curriculum, um, not just a list of spelling. Spellings are important, but this, it's much broader and richer than that. Um, and then we know about 50 percent of schools have a um, have have cut back on key stage three. Um, again, it's not a blame game. You can understand why it's happened. But um, key stage four uh, and the demands and the um, amount of content and the expectations um, for exams at key stage four um, have it have increased. But um, the answer uh, is not to take time from key stage three. The answer is to use think of key stage three as the cognitive powerhouse so that children are well equipped um, you know, to continue at GCSE. And if it's an option, uh, then at least they've had a really good grounding. Because the, the fact is, is that um, children are entitled to the national curriculum until the end of key stage three, which is year nine. So it's not a limiting judgment, but it, the schools need to justify why, um, why that might be the case. Um, then um, there's been some misconceptions around the curriculum. So one is the focus on skills, as those skills are the most important thing, and that they're cost transferable. But in fact, um, skills um, are not generally cross transferable just because I can evaluate and just um, 
dissect something really well in geography doesn't mean to say I can do the same in history if I don't know any history. So we need to think of the skills and knowledge as being like conjoined twins, where through exposure to engagement with and doing something with the rich jewels of the curriculum, um, my skills develop. It's that way around. Um, there's also been some um, misconceptions um, then thinking that it's skills development's the only thing that matters, say, and so you've got children, some children in year seven having um, AQA language paper two type questions uh, in the mistaken belief that's going to get better results five years later. That's not a proper curriculum. What they need is a really rich diet from which those uh, skills will emerge. Um, and then finally, there's been a question of entitlement. So um, what we found is, is that um, uh, there are some children who might need additional support and some of those children get so much additional support and so many interventions that they're missing out on the wider curriculum with their peers. So um, interventions are, are important, but they need to be as efficient and as bespoke and um, have impact as quickly as possible so that children are back with their, uh, with their peers because that's their entitlement. So those are the headlines of the reasons why um, that's fed into the quality of education judgment. And what's underpinning this is um, ambition. So for the first time within a, within, um, a framework, we've got discussion of ambition. OK, to what extent is the curriculum in art school ambitious uh, for all our pupils, regardless of their starting points? Um, um, so, so we've got that there in the in the framework. But what is it that children themselves are saying? So pupil voice um, is a strong thread of my work and research. Um, and um, at the heart of what they're saying is they'd like uh, more demanding work, please. Um, so I was doing a piece of work about 18 months or so ago um, in a school in London where um, I'd been asked to talk to some students that the school had identified as being high prior attaining but underachieving, able but idle. We recognise those characters, don't we? And um, so I sat down and I was talking to them and I said, is there any? So there were um, there were about six of them. Um, they were year nines. They happened to be all boys. And I said, is there any subject in this school where you're not messing around because they weren't working, but they were stopping others from working? And in this school, it turned out it was geography. So I said, tell me what's going on in geography then. That means you're doing your best work and you're letting others. They said, well, our teacher just gives us really difficult, demanding stuff to do and to think about and talk about and to read. So, for instance, for homework, she'll give us articles to read from the National Geographic, for instance. And um, what she says to us is your job for homework is to read this. Now, you're not going to understand it all, but that's all right, because at the start of the next lesson, we're going to talk about what you did understand and what you didn't understand. And they were absolutely lapping it up. Um, now, I was in that teacher's classroom later that day uh, with these characters in there, um, mixed prior attainment. And she had the same high expectations for all the students, regardless of their starting points. And when I looked at the results for geography in that school, a very high performing school, they were the highest by a margin, similarly nationally. Now that teacher didn't give those um, students difficult demanding work above their pay grade in order to get great results. The great results follow from children being given this rich demanding work. So they, they're, they're relishing this, uh, they relish the high challenge, but it has to be accompanied by low threat they mustn't feel as though they failed if they don't get it okay so this notion of high challenge and low threat is really really important now i've got a quick example from primary and um this is from alison peacock's book assessment for learning without limits which came out in 2015 she's another ceo of the chartered college of teaching um, and in this book she and a colleague are interviewing some children as they get moved from year five into year six and what they're trying to tease out is what children think about ability tables. But the children's responses are around the level of work they're given, the amount of challenge, which is why I'm using it. So the first day the children were back, we asked them what they thought of ability groups. The answers were astounding. The more able loved it. They enjoyed being the bright ones and having special challenges set by the teacher. The middle group um, were annoyed that they didn't get the same work and challenges as the other group. They wanted to try harder work, but they'd worked out they'd never be moved up as there were only six seats on the top table. The less able were affected the most. They felt dumb, useless. They thought they'd never be allowed challenges because they usually work with a teaching assistant. And this less able group liked the sound of some of the challenges the top group had, but they knew they would never get the chance. So we've got this then from um, the 
uh, children. We've got this from the uh, inspectorate, this notion of challenge and entitlement. And we're going to see that it's also there in the research as well. So um, just a few thoughts from Dan Williams work, professor of psychology at the University of Virginia. Um, and I've just taken, he's written extensively, I've just taken some of his thoughts from Why Don't Students Like School? <clears throat> and his and he, he and his colleagues work um, has shown that human beings are curious, but thinking is hard. Okay, so if we make things too easy, then the learning is likely not to be so secure. So um, this is really important that we don't dumb things down for our children. Um, on the back of this insight, human beings are curious. Some schools are asking themselves to what extent does our curriculum um, provoke curiosity, which I think is quite a nice lens through which to consider the work. So what happens then when we offer children some demanding text? So the first one I'm just going to show you is from a um, secondary school, year seven, uh, a brilliant historian, uh, Richard Kennett, uh, and also a senior leader across a trust in Bristol. And um, in the lessons, the children are learning about the Norman Conquest. And this is what Richard has given them for homework in terms of these demanding texts. And he said, we tested out the scholarship reading homework with the year seven guinea pig class. Every student could access it, even those with a reading age below 10. Clearly, we need to have higher expectations of these children. So they've been given extracts from Mark Morris's account of the Norman Conquest. All right. So this is not dumbed down. Mark Morris is a world renowned historian. But interestingly, what Richard has said to them is for their homework, he said, um, your job for homework is to read these extracts and answer all the questions. He then goes on to say, this is supposed to be hard. So if you can't answer all the questions, don't worry high challenge, low threat. And what does he find? They all have a go because the threat has been taken away. Um, and then they're using extracts from Simon Shamer's account of the Norman Conquest. He says he wants children understanding that while there might be historical events, historians disagree about the significance and impact of those. Um, quick example from primary. This is Ashley Booth, year six, well worth following if you're on the Twitters. And he um, uh, he's got this to say, why does he hold, love whole class reading so much? Because a child who would long been considered low ability in inverted commas can access texts like The Caged Bird by Maya Angelou with their peers and subsequently that great educational term bang out stuff like this. Now, um, this child has clearly been supported, so it's not that we withdraw support, but actually if they'd not been given and provided with the text, they couldn't have made the connections between the conditions for the bird in the cage and the conditions um, for a large uh, proportion of black American society in the 50s and 60s, very sensitive and sadly still live today. So it's, it's thinking about what are we depriving children of if, if we don't offer them, if we don't offer them these. Okay, um, to develop then the best bets, uh, again from Dan Willingham, um, best bets coming out of the research, which actually they're basically common sense, <laughs> but it's just quite handy that there's been some rigor around um, saying that these could be important. It's never a three line whip for thinking about provision for our children. Um, but Dan's work has shown that um, if, if we learn things through a story, the learning is likely to be deeper. Um, and then when he's talking about story, we're not just talking about novels or fairy tales or poetry or, or even visual um, books. Um, it's also any high quality written text. Um, we've also got this from uh, Stephen Pinker, uh, world renowned scientist. Cognitive psychology has shown that the mind best understands facts when they're woven into a conceptual fabric, such as a narrative, mental map or intuitive theory. Um, disconnected facts in the mind are like unlinked pages on the web. They might as well not exist. Um, so I think this is really helpful for us uh, as we're thinking about the curriculum. Um, but I think it also plays into what I consider to be one of the um, most shameful results of our current system, which I'm going to turn to now. And that is the reading deficit that there is within our schools. So the last year for which there was any data, um, over a quarter of our children didn't reach the expected standard in 2019. I'm just not sure as a sector how we can live with ourselves. Um, I just don't know why this doesn't have more airtime. But I think we've got an opportunity to do something about it.
Um, so some research from the Department for Education a few years ago found that only about 30% of children are read to um, on a daily basis. And some research from Teacher Tap from 2018 found that only 15% of year four children um, are read to in their classes every day. So this is never a blame game, but if we're thinking about the 80-20 rule, I think this is um, somewhere that is ripe for <laughs> taking taking on board. Okay, um, a really nice piece of research which has come out of Sussex University. I'm just going to share the headlines of this quickly. The faster reading research. What they found was uh, simply reading challenging complex novels aloud and at a fast pace in each lesson repositioned poorer readers as good readers, giving them a more engaged, uninterrupted reading experience over a sustained period. So just the headlines of what happened here. Um, the, the groups that were involved, they selected two novels that were at least a year above what children would normally be uh, taught. Um, so that notion of high challenge. Um, this is all they did for 12 weeks. This is all they did for 12 weeks. Now, it wasn't a huge trial. There were 365 year eights. Um, the, the reading scores across the whole of the cohort um, after this project, they increased by eight and a half months. So what did they find with the children who'd been identified as, as poorer readers? It's almost double, almost double. Um, now, there's a very good paper that goes with this, um, the, the um, Sussex faster reading research. Um, and there are just a couple of things I want to pull out from it. When they talk to the children about why they'd done so well, those poorer readers, they said, well, we don't normally get the chance to do this interesting work. So what's the diet for a lot of these children who are identified as poorer readers or low starters in any subject, not just in English? Well, it tends to be a diet of phonics, of decoding, of SPAG and level readers, all of which are necessary, but they're not sufficient. Okay, so unless children are given material above their pay grade, then never, we're never going to close these gaps. Um, they also said we didn't need to understand every word because we could get the gist of it. And also we were able to um, talk about it in class. We really enjoyed it. We wanted to get into it. We wanted to continue, right? really powerful intrinsic motivation yeah that's where we want all our learning to be um and when they talk to the teachers about what their views were and why these children had done so well um for the most part they were surprised they hadn't expected them to do so well so i think as a sector colleagues we need to be prepared to be surprised <laughs> Just give them more demanding work and see what happens if we're serious about closing these gaps. So there's quite a lot of resistance to this. And one of the reasons is, is that, um, well, where's the evidence? You know, we're a sector that's obsessed with evidence, written evidence. But if you look at the English national curriculum, writing is number four in the list. I think that's no coincidence after speaking, listening and reading. So children need to be properly fed if we want decent written outcomes. Um, there's also the sense that, oh, it's it's an enjoyable thing to do, therefore it can't be work. It's what Claire Seeley calls the collective cuddle. We've all had that experience reading aloud to a class that's in primary or secondary and something magical happens to the atmosphere. And we think, well, how can this be work? Well, it is. So we've got quite a few barriers to overcome, but what I'm arguing from this is that um, high quality text, not just in English, but in secondary, um, can fulfill a huge amount uh, on this um, fewer things in greater depth. So I'm arguing that we take a high quality text to underpin new units that we might be working up over time. Why? Because we're all very interested in um, developing the hinterland, the background, the big picture, and a book can do a huge amount of this. So this notion of we know more and understand more if we've got some background knowledge, what um, Christine Council calls the hinterland, very helpful. Um, they contain complex ideas. And one of the threads of the new framework is the importance of concepts. That's also backed up by the evidence. I don't have time to touch on that in this session. Um, but the, the, the high quality text carries this as well. 
it enriches children's vocabulary. So the written word tends to take, contain more sophisticated vocabulary and also sentences of greater lexical depth and complexity. So if we want children to be able to absorb those, they need to be offered it. Okay. Um, so a very efficient way of, of conveying that tier two and tier three vocabulary. And then as we've seen, they're inclusive for all. So what I'm arguing on the 80-20 principle is that um, we've got plenty of opportunities here to address some of the things I've, I've um, identified in terms of uh, the, the shameful results in terms of reading. And this, of course, translates into secondary as well um, by underpinning new work that we're doing with high quality text. So um, particularly as children are asking for more demanding work. So if we're thinking of um, the a year six unit in science, uh, where in the national curriculum it talks about children being taught about um, the theory of evolution um, and inheritance, um, then a high quality text to support this would be Sabina Radeva's On the Origin of Species. Um, why would we select this? Well, Sabina trained as a scientist and then she retrained as an artist. So we've got two threads here, high quality information, and beautiful imagery. Um, uh, and we're able then to draw out the, the important vocabulary that we want our children to be fluent in by the end of the unit through these, through these marvelous resources. Um, and a wonderful thing on um, misconceptions there, really, really helpful for us as teachers who might not have a background in, um, in science. Um, an example from key stage one, uh, so key stage one is generally um, in history, talk about the Great Fire of London. Um, there are plenty of texts out there, but um, I, I had this suggested to me from um, Andrew Percival, who's a deputy head in a school in Oldham, doing terrific work on the curriculum. And I could see why he and his colleagues had selected this, because, again, the images are marvellous, but there's high quality language in there as well. So we've got to move away from um, selecting texts that are broadly where the children's uh, decoding skills are or their ability to read independently are when we're doing this work. And that is because our capacity to understand uh, at an oral level is much more developed than through decoding. All right, so we can understand a lot through hearing it, hearing something being read around, following it in a text, than if we're just given it, uh, just given it. So lots of schools choose books that say, well, this would be suitable for key stage one because it's key stage one vocabulary. That, in my view, is a mistake. Okay, so we need to be careful about the the, the text that we select. Okay, and I've got lots of ideas for how these might be used and developed. Um, so I'm just going to take these really quickly. There are high quality texts underpinning every part of the curriculum. Okay, and um, what's quite often um, less well addressed is, is the art history part of um, the, the national curriculum for art, which, by the way, well, you don't need me to tell you, it's extremely thin. Uh, it didn't have the Michael Gove treatment that history did, um, and it suffers a bit for that, but also creates lots of opportunities. So this marvellous work by David Hockney and, and Martin Gayford. Um, Gombrich's Little History of the World, I've used this to plan for year eight and share with students, but I was on a call recently with someone saying they'd used it in year five. How marvellous is that? Because really high quality texts are written with great succinctness and clarity that mean you can take it across key stages. Um, so to bear that in mind as well. Now, sometimes people say there aren't any stories in maths. There are masses of stories in maths. Um, so just one uh, example, Alex Bellos's work. But, you know, how many of our children know the story of zero? How many children know where algebra came from? You know, there are stories sitting behind all these. Uh, some schools are using Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind um, in Science. So there are some schools that have taken on board this research and their reading allowed 800 words as a minimum every every lesson. OK, music to my ears. Um, this is um, beautifully written. Richard Feynman, Six Easy Pieces in Physics. Um, uh, ben Rogers as well um, in the sector. Big ideas. Um, and I'm reading this at the moment. Carla Ravelli's Seven Brief History, uh, Seven Brief Lessons on Physics. And I don't have a background in science, but within seven pages, he's written the most elegant, most simple in the first chapter on Einstein's theory of general relativity. 
not to say that you are then an expert on it, but you've got a, you've got an idea of the scope of it. Um, I think that could go into upper key stage two. Actually, I'd be prepared to risk that. Um, for RE, wonderful for geography, um, and um, an interesting one for uh, secondary English in Baruma's Grand Zero. Um, what conditions were like in 1945 at the end of the Second World War by way of background for J.B. Priestley's and Inspector Calls. Um, where are you really from, Amanda uh, McWash's work, CEO of uh, Christian Aid? Uh, absolutely fascinating for PSHE, RE, probably get some geography and history, all sorts of things out of there. Absolutely marvellous and um, really, really good. Um, and then... Um, a neat unit that I've developed across geography under pulling out one, some of the key ideas from early years up to key stage two using high quality text. And we don't need many. We don't want this overloaded because a high quality text reveals more and more as we use it. So this is about um, teaching children about geological formations and rocks and stones and pebbles. It starts with a lovely poem from Shirley Hughes, Out and About, uh, take it into key stage one, the street beneath my feet, absolutely stunning. Charlotte um, Gillen's work illustrated by Yuval Sommer and then in key stage two, the pebble in my pocket. All these can do the heavy lifting for, um, for what we're trying to do in this way that is both um, really rigorous, but actually lighter, lighter touch. Um, and so I'm going to turn now to what is it that we should be cutting in order to find these marvelous books <laughs> and, so, and resources, okay? Because we can't simply can't do everything. So one of the things um, when we're back in normal times, I'm not talking about now colleagues, I think we think about how we use meetings um, so there are plenty of meetings that could be handled in an email or just a brief summary and that we turn over our meetings to um, in secondary, which is what lots of schools are doing, is they're turning them over to discussions about books, reading, what they're going to do with children. Uh, a lovely example from primary where there was one head who was concerned that his staff did not have um, a particularly broad understanding of children's literature beyond a diet of Dahl and Williams. And um, so uh, they came in for a, what they thought was a normal staff meeting uh, before lockdown. This was, and it was just a pile of children's books. And he said to them, well, just pick up one that you like the look of and spend the next half an hour, three quarters of an hour skimming it or reading it. And we'll just come back and chat about it at the end. So what did he find? Virtually all of them wanted to take it home. That wasn't the intention, but it applies to us as adults, as well as children. When we give an interesting, demanding, intriguing stuff it provokes our curiosity we want to carry on so it's just about thinking imaginatively as and when time allows um this also links to not meetings per se but it, it there's a thread that does relate to this in the implementation part of the new framework um which talks about teachers having good subject knowledge and where they've not got good subject knowledge leaders have put in place appropriate support okay so it's never a blame game it's like what what are we doing about it um uh data um so uh there are some real problems with the way data is being used in schools um you know it's not linear learning is not linear and um we've got to rethink about how we talk about progress um it is the curriculum itself that is the progression model. It's the curriculum itself that is the progression model. So basically, I have taught it. Have my children got it? How do I know? That is it. Um, so what kind of evidence might we pick up on to show that our to, to have some evidence that um, or, or, or some insights as to whether our children have learned what we've taught them? Well, we have a look at their work. Uh, we take account of what they have to say because if a child can't talk about it or demonstrate in some way that what i've taught them they can now do they haven't learned it right and then i can make some observations as well about what um about what they have um what they have done it doesn't need thousands of photographs we're professionals. We have a right to say, my children could do this now. They couldn't do it 10 days or so ago. That is enough. Oh, and by the way, yes. Oh, th this is my point. <laughs> what is it the inspection teams are looking at to make some judgments about whether, children, whether there's any impact on what children have been taught? They have a look at their books. And so if those books are just full of um, 
worksheets, random worksheets. This is a bit tricky uh, because they will have a chat with some of them, not to catch them out. Um, but I was I was talking to a child um, before lockdown in year four. I wasn't on inspection. This was just some piece of work I was I was doing, <clears throat> and we were looking at her literacy book and there's some lovely stuff in there. So we were having a good chat about that. But I noticed a few lessons before she'd been learning about homophones. So I assumed she'd learned it because she'd completed a sheet, downloaded from the internet, ticked off smiley face by the teacher, no doubt sitting on some spreadsheet, having turned that key performance indicator green. So I assumed she'd learned it. So I said to her, oh, homophones, those are really interesting. So what have you learned about homophones? Not a clue, not a clue. Bright little thing, but it's because the completion of the task was more important than whether the child had learned it. So just to be mindful that, you know, children completing activities is not the same as them learning stuff. Uh, it's completely different if they've been learning stuff through a book, a proper book. Um, so Tim Oates, um, who led on the review of the national curriculum, he talks about the products of pupils learning. So we get insights as professionals into whether our children have learned anything, and it's very slippery trying to do this, um, through what they produce. So what are some of the things that they might produce? All right, so these are just some samples. There could be the results of low stakes quizzes that don't need to go anywhere near a spreadsheet. So there's a lot of evidence that low stakes testing actually supports learning. Okay, so this is good for children. What children say, extended writing, and it could be other things. So for instance, we all know Austin's butterfly, don't we? Uh, so I've just taken a screenshot at the end of that short film um, where Ron Berger set up how uh, a child's work can improve with appropriate peer feedback moderated by the teacher. So that's where Austin starts on the top left, bottom right is where he finished. This is not an art piece of artwork, this is um, science, so it's an accurate drawing of a swallowtail butterfly, which this child has been expected to do. So the question is, does Austin have a sense of the progress he's made? Yep. Would the teacher be able to look at that work and be able to make a judgment about whether Austin had made progress? Yep. Could some external person including an Ofsted inspector, be able to make a judgment about whether Austin had made progress. I think they could. And if they can't, they shouldn't be doing the job. Does it need a number? No. So the, it's evident in the work itself. Okay. Um, then they might also show what they know understand can do through things like uh, double page spreads. So this is all, these are authentic voices of children coming through. Great work from um, Paul Watson. He's Paul Watt 5 on the Twitters. Uh, North Ormsby Academy does amazing work with his children. But um, because it's always for an audience, um, it's it's absolutely tremendous. Um, we could also um, use some comparative judgment work. Uh, standardized assessments do have some greater validity than internally generated school numbers. Um, so, and I'm sure you've got plenty of uh, support and resources around that for ARBA. But basically what we're saying is, I've got evidence as a teacher, I've taught this unit on Roman Britain, that most of my children have got it, they're fine. Some of them have gone in a bit deeper, so we might want to just colour code that slightly. And this is a group I'm concerned about, and this is what I'm doing about them. All right, it is as simple as that, doesn't need. So these little steps, we've got to show progress of steps. That is levels language, that went in 2013. I know you don't need me to tell you but there's still a lot of discourse about it. Anyway, so marking, uh, if we're serious about uh, cutting back, this is one of the places we, we've really got to focus. So I'm gonna let you read that from Dylan William. <clears throat> right. If we want to carve out time to develop subject knowledge, this is for the hit list. <laughs> Instead, things like whole class feedback, whole class feedback much more effective in terms of um, impact at the start of the next lesson, much deeper learning, much sooner. Oh, and by the way, saves time for teachers. Don't need to do this every lesson, just as and when it's appropriate. Okay, plenty of, uh, plenty of resources out there on the internet for that. Okay, colleagues, so I'm just going to wrap this up as we ask ourselves what adds great the greatest value. And I'm drawing here as I wrap this up on, on Rosa Beth Moss Cantor's work, and she talks about the six keys to success. Um, so Moss Cantor has been working as an academic, um, um, in, uh, as a professor at Harvard, Harvard for several um, decades, and her work has focused on 
the characteristics of people working in organizations, whether it's public or private, who do good work in, in the largest sense. OK, do good work. And she's noticed these six things. So the first is that they show up. So the question I ask myself is, am I bringing my complete self to my work or am I distracted or am I tempted to send a quiet email when I'm in me a meeting with other people? I bring my complete self to my work. Uh, we speak up and we encourage others to speak up. We've all got the right and the entitlement to have our voices and ideas heard. We look up, we remind ourselves why we're doing this work. We team up and there've been great examples of this over the last year, but as a rule, greater outcomes when we team up. So there'll be, there'll be occasions where we want to do individual pieces of work and reading, et cetera, but by and large, any curriculum development work really ought to be jointly with other people. Uh, we never give up. She has a very good way of putting it. She says it never feels like success when you're in the middle of it. Okay, that's just how it is. So we pause, we take breath, and if it's worthwhile, we continue when we've when we've got enough strength again, but not give up if it's worthwhile. And for me, the most important one is that we lift others up. I think it's one of the greatest gifts we can give to another human being is to encourage them. So um, I'm just going to draw this to a close, colleagues, by saying let's remember that we're human beings first as we go about this work. We're professionals second, that the young people we work with are human beings first and their learners second. So I'm going to pause there. And I'm very happy to take some questions, which I hope have come into the chat. Thank you, colleagues. Mary, thank you so much. Um, I think at the beginning you, you quoted uh, rest as a responsibility and not a luxury. And, and that was both a luxurious session. Um, but at the same time, I felt able to kind of stand back and, and rest a little bit while you helped me guide my own thinking. So thank you. Um, I, I think uh, this particular question about doing um, less, a uh, few things in greater depth, even with our team here at Arbor, everybody's been so incredibly um, sort of enthusiastic and, and desperate to help schools as we go through this kind of crazy time of change. Um, and they've been very hard on themselves and not giving themselves a chance to rest as well. So please all Arbor colleagues, as well as everybody in schools, take, take some heed from what Mary says, it really is okay to do just a little bit less sometimes. Um, if we don't have any um, any questions, I can't see any questions coming, but I'm just going to check in the chat as well. But we have a lot of people asking for the reading list. I was desperately trying to open tabs, but maybe we can, uh, between Becca and I, we can write up the list of books that you um, recommended and share that with the talk afterwards as well. Um, there were certainly a few that I wish I'd read on there as well. Um, if anybody has any real questions, you're very welcome to post them. Um, um and also to make sure that you're going to be going to the right session next so i'll just post a link to that too um, everybody said they needed that helen ross says um how do you see the use of picture books as quality text compared to the text that you mentioned uh yes um <clears throat> so uh, i rate them very highly um i just haven't produced any materials or resources around those at the moment uh, but it's on my list of things to do. Um, so I'm thinking in particular of things like Sean Towns, The Arrival. Um, there are lots and lots of high quality um, visual texts and picture books. Uh, they're not taken as seriously as they should be in mm. the sector. Um, but there's plenty of evidence that children are able to make really deep inferences and insights from from visual texts um and so there's more work that i want to do around this there's, there's plenty of research that i just don't think it is talked about enough yeah. and again it's this obsession with the written word and children producing written stuff i'm all for children writing lovely stuff but actually just let's make sure that it is decent quality that they've been fed with um mm -hmm. so yeah re really really uh, um important i think thanks yeah. good yeah, I have an um, uh, illustrated version of Sapiens, actually, that was one of the books you mentioned, which is a beautiful book. So I think for Upper Key Stage 2, you get all of the context, but it's an amazing, amazing text. So highly recommend that as well. Um, I think there was another question in here. It might have moved to the questions tab. Um, we're talking about in-class intervention, which I think is something that you mentioned briefly. Um, I don't know if there's something more you'd want to say on, on intervention management. Um, okay, so is this Nigel's question? Yeah. 
Sorry? Yes, it is, yeah. Keen to move away from teachers spending time focusing on in-class intervention, not outside of lesson intervention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so my view is that we pitch material high, that we identify um, the key vocabulary and the potential misconceptions, and we pre-teach those where appropriate. I think in general that is a good thing. Um, and there's plenty of good um, work and suggestions on this in uh, Bringing Words to Life, Isabel Beck's and colleagues' work. So I can send a list over of the things that I'm suggesting um, so that we keep we keep the, the class together as much as possible. And I've, so it's not that they can't have, I'm not saying they don't have outside interventions, it's just when they get locked into those. Yeah. Um, and so then what those children have are the opportunities to hear those discussions around them. And this is what emerged from the research from Sussex, yeah. the fast reading research, but talking to, to um, Richard Kennett with that history example, um, he was saying those low prior attaining students would not have been able to do it on, if they'd, if they'd just been there on, on their own, mm -hmm. they been from hearing the broader discussions and were able to enter into that dialogue because of what they were hearing. And that applies to all of us, whatever our prior attainment is. Um, so it's inclusion at its deepest, at its deepest sense. Yeah. Um, to say children don't need some some you know some phonics and decoding, but it's got to be support, but it's got to be really, really, really efficient. Yeah. Um, be prepared to be surprised. Um, so I was talking recently uh, um, to, a, to a senior leader who was saying that he had wanted to give his a particular child and the, no, the parents of a particular child had wanted the child to have more demanding work. And the, the senior leader head said, well, he can't have it because he's still not decoding his leveled readers. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, how's he ever going to catch up? You know, and that's why I made the point that our oral and is much more developed than our, than our visual decoding. Yeah. Um, but I've got real concerns about leveled readers when they get stuck on those. There's yeah. no scientific evidence for them. No. Anyway, it's for another <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah, I'm catching up. I think Georgina's question is quite interesting. So, um, um, you know, great that there's been another year of non-sats, but at the same time, uh, do you have any words of wisdom to reassure secondary colleagues who might have felt the need for those? So when they, you know, new year seven's coming in, how do we help them feel calm, calmer? Well, oh, New Year Sevens, yes, the, the job should be of secondary schools to um, be full of hospitality and warmth to these <laughs> youngsters coming through. Um, so I'm talking to a number of schools about this. Um, so um, doing some reading uh, tests relatively early on. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, why do schools, why do secondary schools need to know? They need to know who might be seriously behind, but just just teach them all and um don't worry too much about sets you know i think that why do, why do they need to know it's because they want to be able to partition children quite often into into sets i think there's a case for maths um uh but all the evidence is is that um outcomes are better for all children uh if they're taught in mixed prior attainment classes um and you know people quite often ask me well what would i be doing if i were back in school particularly when this was september and people were preparing to go back on the evidence of the research as it currently stands and i reserve the right to change my mind as the information changes but i'd have been spending the first minimum of three lessons at key stage three with my classes reading aloud to them Right. Because that would draw them back in in a very invitational way to the discipline of religious education. So I'd be using things like the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Primo Levis, if this be a man uh, that was going to take them into that territory and also provide them with really rich ideas. And we wouldn't do much writing, <laughs> very little writing to begin with. <laughs> um and there's that probably helps also with, De with deb harris's question which is um what advice do you have for providing the additional support that some people's oh, some pupils would need without narrowing their curriculum experiences but in a way that's been the whole body of your talk <laughs> um um yeah um georgina's point i think is an interesting one sats are used to make uh, gcse predictions mm -hmm. why why are we making using SATs to make GCSE predictions? 
why are we predicting? You know, so there's a big issue around um, secondary colleagues talking about Fisher Family Trust targets. They're not targets, they're estimates. Mm. And actually, when you look at the at, you look at the range of children who uh, from similar starting points arrive at different starting points, you know, it's it's huge. Um, you know, a child could have had grandma dying a couple of days before SATs, could have been under colour mm. and get locked into, well, you're only you're only um you're only predicted a four. That's really going to motivate me. The top grade I can get is a four. Mm, five years I, ago. <laughs> I think lots of children are suffering from this. Yeah. So I'm very simple on this. Both in primary, I think, you know, the target should be 100% of our children reach the expected standard in reading. And that is possible because of the way the algorithms work and because it's based, it's criterion referenced. The GCSEs and BTECs, or GCSEs in particular, and that's different because they're norm reference and you've got the bell curve. I mean, so that is more complicated. But why not just set every child who arrives in my classes the ambition for a nine? Now, they're not all going to get a nine, but why should I spend time thinking you're only worth a level three, a grade three? I mean, so I think we've got to really shift some narratives here. Yeah. Agreed. What a wonderful opportunity we now have in the world to do that, at least. Um, OK, I'm conscious that we just have a few minutes and people might want to get their cup of tea or coffee before the next session as well. So um, unless there's any final questions just popping up, there's just a, some good agreement, which is great to see. Um, so as I said, we're going to share Mary's slides um, and we'll, try, we'll write up a reading list. So it's easy for you to find those texts as well. Some of us might want to read them ourselves as well as taking them back into the classroom. Thank you so, so much, Mary. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear you talk and to think uh, uh, about all of our responsibilities for getting everyone back on track as well. So thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Philippa. And thank you for everyone who posed questions. They were great. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Have a good day. Ah!